if you are here looking for a grit health program on navigating blood cancer, you landed in the right spot. Thank you for joining us. Um, as you may know, September mm-hmm. is Blood Cancer Awareness Month, so we're really happy to have our partner organization, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, on to share some information with us um, just about common things that are happening in the blood cancer world right now, and then also talk about uh, some clinical trial stuff as well as you know, emerging information on some treatments that are available that are really exciting and present a lot of hope. So. We have our guests here today from, like I said, LLS, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Uh, Today's program is being recorded. So after the program, in probably a week or two, you'll get an email from the Grit Health team with a link to view the recording and also a summary blog that we write up in case you don't have an extra hour to rewatch us. That'll be available, and we'll also share where you can get more information about LLS and blood cancer. And um, just as a friendly reminder, as always, uh, this is meant to be informational. We're not giving out any medical advice. Those decisions should always be made with you and your healthcare team. And um, so for tonight, if you have questions that pop up during the entire presentation, just feel free to drop them right in the chat. I'm going to pause our speakers every so often and ask them questions if you guys come up with them. So don't wait. I know I'm the same. I have to get my question out or it's gone forever. So just throw it in the chat and we'll be happy to get to it. And without further ado, I will go ahead and hand it over to one of our first speakers uh, from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. We have Jennifer on and then she will hand it to Chrissy. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much, Lauren, and good evening, everybody. And I really appreciate the opportunity to represent LLS and be with all of you here this evening. And so please, like Lauren said, ask questions. If there's something I can answer, I'd be happy to do so. Um, So we'll just start with the mission of LLS. And the mission of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is to cure leukemia, leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin disease, myeloma, and improve the quality of life of patients and families. We fund research to advance life-saving treatments, and we drive advocacy for policies that protect patient access to life-saving treatment. And we provide patients and families with hope, guidance, education, and support. And so I um, am part of the Information Resource Center, and I've been in the Information Resource Center for 13 years, spending most, most of my days speaking to blood cancer patients, their families, their friends. I wanted to first show you this little, it's a very quick little video that they made about the IRC. And I just think it's a nice introduction to the work that I do. And I know, Lauren, you had said that um, I can send you some of the links to be able to send to people afterwards so that they can have access to this information. So first, I wanted to just tell you about some of the LLS supports. We have a First Connection program where it's a peer-to-peer matching program. So 
A lot of times people like it right at the time when they're first diagnosed, but other times people are going on to a different treatment or maybe going into a clinical trial, and they really just want to talk with someone who just gets it. They're not going to have to explain what it is or what the treatment is. They just get it. And so that's the first connection program. We also have the LLS community which is another way for people to connect, sort of a a broader way. So you can go specifically on to your diagnosis or young adult or transplant, and you can pose a question to the group of people who have had a similar experience. And you don't get an answer in that moment, but you will get an answer. The other thing we have is online chats, and some of these are specific to diagnosis. There is also a young adult chat, and for the most part, they meet once a week for two hours uh, at a time, and they're moderated by an oncology social worker, and some of them are very robustly attended, and people really know each other from week to week. Then on to disease and treatment information. We have free materials. We have a lot of booklets. They're updated every year to two years, depending on how much has changed in that disease space. We have webcasts where we have some key opinion leaders come on and present the latest information about a specific disease. We have videos. We have also something that's sort of newer is our 3D model library. So if you want to sort of see what non-Hodgkin lymphoma looks like from the inside, it allows you to sort of go through the body and it shows the different cells and how they may interact. And it is a very sort of popular tool that people seem to like. The other thing that we have, and I would say if they're blood cancer patients attending this program today, we have blood cancer conferences and our national program is going to be held this Saturday. So certainly if that's something someone's interested in, they're terrific. And the good thing is, you know, they're more general for the first part of the program. And then there's breakout sessions for the second half of the program. The other, we have nutrition consults. And this really is actually not just for blood cancer patients, but it's for any cancer patient. We have a registered dietitian who has expertise in oncology nutrition, and she uh, provides patients, parents, caregivers with um, a free nutritional consult. It, you usually can schedule it online or by phone. And then she'll call you and you speak for half an hour and she has a lot of great suggestions. Um, And, you know, people call like, you know, if they're really having trouble with the taste of food or they have a loss of appetite or been told to drink more, but they can't really quite figure out what will taste okay. Um, And many of the people who have spoken with the, with the dietitian have given her rave reviews to us when they then subsequently called the IRC. We have a policy and advocacy department. Um, so it's grassroots network of more than 30,000 active members. They advocate at the state and federal level that safely accelerate the development of new treatments and break down barriers that patients may be experiencing to care. And really also emphasizing trying to reduce out-of-pocket costs for cancer patients during this crisis and, and beyond. The other thing we have is the Clinical Trial Support Center, which is Chrissy, who's going to speak next. And she will be the absolute best person to tell you about this fabulous program. But I can say that I very often refer to her the Clinical Trial Support Center, because it really is a wonderful offering for blood cancer patients. The other thing that we have this year that sort of really 
robustly took off is that we have the, na- the LLS National Patient Registry. So what happened was we sort of were, they were looking into sort of having a registry and then we found ourselves in the middle of a pandemic and we realized that it was essential to be able to give data and information about how blood cancer patients, uh, the blood cancer community was doing with respect to COVID care, vaccination. And since this started, we have close to 9,000 people who are participating. And so we're going to use this data to really help push, you know, the, this information out there and to help to just help improve like what the researchers know, you know, because we really are monitoring people's antibodies, you know, pre-vaccine, after the first vaccine, after the second vaccine, seeing who do, who mounted an immune response, who may not have, what treatments they may have been on. So it's we're really hoping that this data can be very impactful uh, throughout the the research world, and I think it already is because it's, they've already published several articles um, in prominent magazine in prominent journals. So it's it's really important work. Um, I am in, like I said, the Information Resource Center. I've been there 13 years. We are all master's level professionals. Um, most of us are social workers. We do have a nurse. We have some master's librarian, library science, um, health educators, but mostly social workers. I think there is about 15 of us now, and we're open from nine in the morning until nine at night, Eastern time. And we don't, you know, we know that people want to communicate with us in different, like, you know, there's not one set way people want to communicate with us. So we take incoming calls, we have a chat feature, we, people send us emails, but we also get referrals from healthcare professionals asking us to reach out to people and we do all of that. The other program we have is we have financial programs. Sometimes we have funding for copay assistance, travel assistance, urgent need, which is broken up to under 39 and over 39. We have patient aid, which is for anyone. It's like a one-time $100 to just sort of help fill your tank with gas to get to appointments or do whatever you need to do in that moment. We also recently launched and are sort of taking applications for people who are seeking um, scholarships about to stay in school. And so that is currently underway. We also have regional staff who... I call up when I need to know what's going on in a specific reason, region, but they really have the n- local knowledge and they have local patient and family support groups. They have lo- local education programs. And after, since uh, the IRC is supposed to be the f- first point of entry into the organization often for blood cancer patients, the region will follow up to just reach out and let them know what services they have and what's available in people's communities. And then the final thing I would say about this spoke or this wheel over here is our research department. I think it's a time where we really have a lot of hope that things are really getting, getting better. Like we have LLS has helped advance every critical advancement in blood cancer treatment, including the pioneering chimeric antigen receptor, CAR-T, that Chrissy is going to be speaking about. Um, We fund the most high-impact projects worldwide and lead to collaborative precision medicine clinical trials to accelerate new treatments, discoveries, and cures. LLS has been helped advance more than 85% of blood cancer treatment approved by the FDA since 2017. And in 2020, LLS helped advance 14 of the 17 approved treatment 
blood cancer treatments options approved by the FDA. So I'm really proud of, you know, just the direction that's taking because I think we need more treatments and, and we need more trials to get us to those cures. And I know I've probably talked too long, Lauren, so tell me, is there anything I need to be answering or saying? Or? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, quickly ask, and, you know, I think it was in the little the little video, but all of the resources offered by LLS are completely free to the community, correct? Absolutely. I mean, you know, if a, if a treatment provider wants them, if an individual wants them, uh, we have a nice offering like for the caregiver to sort of help organize some of the chaos. Um, it has a tote bag, a pill case, a journal, um, and everything is always free. I, I know sometimes people are like, well, do I need to get out my credit card? No, 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 no. Like, let's, let, let me see what I can do to help you now to navigate this, you know, new diagnosis. And then, you know, that's where we're starting right now. I'll get, I'm going to get you the materials. And what we like to do, ideally, is send people a follow-up email. Um, because I feel like I might start where you're at right this moment, but I kind of know, you know, you're not sure what direction you want to go with how to get support or what other organizations to go to, you know, so we put it all together. We, we sent, you know, we send a personalized email to most people we talk to. I would say the only people we probably don't may not have email or may not want one. And that would be it. So now I'm just going to give you some of the like some of the types of calls that we get so that you have an idea of what's going on. So one of the calls. So I just tried to keep track of some of the calls that I heard in the last two weeks. So these are all current. I have spoke to someone who has chronic myeloid leukemia who just decided after a few weeks to stop taking their treatment. And it was, you know, I needed to provide sort of patient education. I needed to make sure that they were communicating with their medical doctor. I helped them come up with questions to ask about, you know, how to manage the side effects. And so I, to try to guide them down the path of really being able to resume the medication and emphasizing sort of the importance of it. Um, I spoke with a Hodgkin lymphoma woman who was a teacher, and she had quit her job when she got diagnosed. And so she was calling me. She was back in the classroom, but she was in a new, new school. She didn't have the same supports and connections that she had previously. And she was just completely overwhelmed, really having a hard time focusing and feeling like she just couldn't do this. Um, so I provided support. I listened. I gave her some organizations of where she could go to get some support and, you know, who she could speak to to get that support. Someone called today. We're going for a stem cell transplant consultation. It was 250 miles away. He and his wife were very low income and the cost of getting the 250 miles was just prohibitive. And they were told that they had to stay overnight at a hotel. And it was just like such a huge weight on him. And, you know, so I, I had some ideas of ways that might be able to help him that we talked about. Another a transportation, I've got to say, and financial are some of the biggest forces that drive people to contact the IRC. And once they're there, we have the opportunity to tell them all the other things that we have and ways that we can support them and things we can do. But it's the financial piece that really leads to patients calling us. Like someone couldn't get into New York City and she has to go five days a week and it's, you know, 70 miles. So there are many sort of complicated scenarios like this. You know, people call for things that we can't help them with, like a CLL patient who says, I found out I don't have any antibodies from the antibody study at the registry. And 
I'd like to know if you think I should see my grandchildren who I haven't seen in two years. Like, you know, like I can't, like I, I can say it's really essential that you, know, you follow your doctor's recommendations around vaccination, that you behave as though you're not vaccinated, just to follow as many precautions as you can to protect yourself. As bad as I feel that they haven't seen their grandchildren, I, you know, I'm not, we're not going to be the ones to say, oh, sure, then of course, you, you know, like we just won't say that. And we're not going to give medical advice um, because we're not doctors. I'm a social worker, you know, and the other thing is, well, I don't know. I think I probably said too much, right, Lauren? Tell me, because poor Chris has so much to say. She is so incredibly knowledgeable about CAR T. I, I, I don't know. Do I hand off? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll hand it over to Chris, uh, to Chrissy here in a second, but just really wanted to reiterate, you know, everything you said that, you know, if you call the information resource center and you're needing help as a blood cancer patient, survivor, caregiver, um, that there's help out there. And you, you guys are the top notch experts in getting people in the blood cancer world help and that you're trained social workers. And if you, you know, LLS doesn't have the perfect solution, you guys are going to point people in the right direction. So we want whatever is best for whoever we're working with. I mean, there's no two ways about it. We, you know, people need the best solutions possible. They need caring support. We, we offer that to everyone who contacts us. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I think now is a good time. We will hand it over to Chrissy, who's also with us tonight from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Um, and I believe Chrissy has a slide. Jennifer, if you can move to her slide. And then Chrissy, you can take it away. And then I know I'm going to ask you uh, some questions and really get into things uh, on the treatment side of things and clinical trials. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for attending. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Lauren. Thanks for having me. And thanks to your team and everyone who um, is attending tonight. So my name is Chrissy Cuss. I work for the Clinical Trial Support Center at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I am a nurse navigator, and I help uh, patients and their families uh, find clinical trials, um, search for second opinions. I educate on um, treatments that patients are currently um, receiving. Um, the Clinical Trial Support Center, or we refer to us as the CTSC, was developed in 2016 because more and more patients were calling um, Jennifer and her team, the, the IRC, wanting to learn more about clinical trials. So the team, uh, the CTSC that um, is now 10 nurses, was actually started by one time part, one part-time nurse. Um, but ever since the time we started in 2016 to today, our mission still remains the same. We want to help patients. We want to help their families um, identify potential clinical trials that they may be eligible for, and then overcome the barriers to enrolling in those clinical clinical trials. Like I said, our team is uh, 10 nurses. We um, are available at no cost to patients, and we are specially trained not only in blood cancer and clinical trials, but also heavily in patient education and patient support. Our primary goal is the same for everyone, to educate, support, and empower patients and their families um, to be active participants in their treatment decisions, increase opportunities for participation in clinical trials, and then facilitate shared decision-making between um, healthcare teams and uh, the patients that we're working with. Um, so here on the screen, you see um, there's some ways that you can um, get a hold of our team. If you go on LLS's website, there's a form that you can fill out if you you have interest in searching for clinical trials, um, learning about clinical trials, um, and someone from our team will receive that referral form and they'll reach out to you right away and um, have a pretty lengthy phone call with you, kind of get some information about what you're looking for and um, tailor, you know, to your needs. And then that nurse is assigned to you indefinitely for as long as you'd like to have um, a working relationship with our team. Uh, so my background um, prior to coming to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, I, I am a nurse and I started out as a stem cell transplant nurse in an academic institution here in the Midwest. 
And um, around 2017, I decided to move to the West Coast where I managed a large number of clinical trials utilizing cell therapy, particularly CAR T cell therapy, as most of you have probably heard um, it referred to. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, in addition to what our team at LLS does, is what CAR T cell therapy is um, and how to prepare um, if you or a loved one is going to be going through that therapy. So Jennifer, I'll have you just advance to the next slide for me. So CAR-T was, um, it's been in clinical trials for many, many years, uh, but it was first FDA approved in 2017 for pediatric ALL, that's anyone under the age of 25, um, or adult non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Those were the first products and they were FDA approved in 2017. It is in clinical trials um, for many other things, um, including um, mostly every type of blood cancer and many solid tumor cancers as well. Um, so where we get the T-cell um, in the name is that T-cells are central to our immunity, but sometimes in the patients we work with, um, particularly patients with blood cancer, um, their immune system has failed to eliminate cancer for a number of reasons. So CAR um, stands for chimeric antigen receptor. And there on the screen, you can see um, what, what that means exactly. So uh, chimeric is something that's made up of two kinds of DNA. So self, and then one made in the lab. Antigen is the protein on a cancer cell that a CAR T cell is going to target. Um, and that's different for every type of cancer. And then receptor, the R in CAR, is the um, CAR protein that's added to the surface of a patient's own T cell that goes into a patient's body and searches for an antigen on a cancer cell. Um, what this CAR technology does is that it, it allows our own immune system cells to recognize a target cell in a patient's body, proliferate in numbers, so multiply, and then attack a target cell um, with the goal of um, getting rid of a patient's cancer. So how do we do that, right? Um, Jennifer, I'll have you advance to the next slide. So particularly what I'm talking about um, tonight is autologous CAR T cell therapy. What that means is autologous means self. Um, so it's a patient's own T cells. So um, one thing I really always like to stress and um, educate patients on if this is something that's, you know, upcoming or future in their treatment plan is that one, you have to go to a, a particular type of center to receive this therapy. Not just any um, cancer center can do this. Um, they're called authorized treatment centers, um, whether it's on a clinical trial or not, it's an authorized treatment center um, to give this therapy. And when you go to that center, you're not necessarily getting the treatment you know, right away. Um, you'll go to that center, you'll be evaluated, you'll have a consult with a team of healthcare providers who will explain the therapy to you. Um, once you've been deemed to be a good candidate for that therapy, what happens is you, um, your cells are collected. So blood is drawn out of you um, through an IV and um, your blood enters a machine that you're hooked up to and you're awake for this. It doesn't require like anesthesia or anything like that. Um, it's just, it's almost like donating blood. Um, your blood filters through a machine um, and your immune system cells are, are kept in the machine and then the rest of your blood um, is put back. So it doesn't wipe out all of your immune system cells. It just um, pulls out a small number of your T cells that are needed um, to manufacture this product. So those cells are then sent off to a manufacturing facility um, where they are put in the lab um, and this, this technology, this CAR technology um, is added to their surface. Um, this generally takes around two to four weeks. Um, and during that time, depending on the patient's um, disease level, what their physician thinks is best, during this two to four week time frame, patients might receive what's called bridging therapy um, because as you all know, um, blood cancers can progress very quickly. And so um, two to four weeks can seem like an eternity if a patient isn't receiving any type of um, treatment. So oftentimes patients receive um, at least steroids, um, if not some other type of chemotherapy to keep their disease burden under control while the cells are manufacturing. Then the cells um, are... Um, like I said, manufactured, the, the CAR protein is um, inserted into the T cells. The T cells are multiplied into the millions and then um, sent back to the facility. Now, the T cells, like I, I know the number millions sounds a little overwhelming, but what you in reality get back is a very small bag um, of clear 
almost completely clear liquid. Um, and it is your uh, own manufactured um, supercharged immune system cells that are going to target your specific type of cancer. So these cells are infused back into a patient, um, either in a hospital setting or an, an outpatient clinic. Um, and whether or not a patient, you know, what, depending on whether a patient gets inpatient treatment or outpatient treatment, their follow-ups um, look a little bit different. And I can talk about that in a little bit. Um, but the cells are infused back into a patient. They're monitored daily for the first couple of weeks, and then it becomes a little less um, frequent over, uh, up until day 30. And then they're um, referred back to their um, referring physician or their community oncologist. So that's just kind of the process. And Lauren and I have worked um, to prep a couple of questions that are common questions um, that patients and their families ask. Um, so we're going to hop into that if Lauren's ready for that. Sure. So, um, actually, oh, this is hi, this Dan. is Dan, <laughs> hi, the chief medical officer of Grit. Lawrence having some hey. Zoom issues, so okay. I was going to jump in and help out. Hi, Dan. Um, so the first question: uh, What are the main side effects of CAR T, and how do you monitor for them? Yeah. So. Um, the way that I explain the main side effects of CAR T-cell therapy are two umbrellas, if you will. One umbrella is what is referred to as cytokine release syndrome or CRS. A very simple way of explaining cytokine release syndrome is if you have ever had the flu um, or, you know, some type of virus, um, the way that you feel, you know, muscle aches, headaches, chills, fevers, nausea, vomiting, generally feeling unwell, um, is your body's um, response to something foreign. So when we feel that way, when we have the flu, it's not because the flu virus makes us have a fever, makes us tired, makes us have headaches, etc. It's because our body says, hey, that's not normal. Let's get rid of that. And it's and our immune system supercharges and causes um, a cascade of um, inflammation inside of our bodies. So imagine that you know, that phenomenon in manufacturing a patient's immune system to target something specific, we're creating that. Um, so when these cells go into a patient and they find their target, they're going to multiply, they're going to release what's called cytokines or chemical messengers into the body that say, kill this foreign thing. Um, and, and generally, uh, most patients experience some degree of cytokine release syndrome. The onset is generally, you know, a couple days after the cell infusion up to, you know, around 20 days after cell infusion. So because of that, it's important that these patients are monitored at, you know, authorized treatment facilities where the staff that are, that are managing their care really know how to manage those side effects. Um, it's also crucially important that um, patients that are going through this therapy have a caregiver who has um, undergone education um, from the healthcare staff about these side effects and um, how to monitor for them, you know, taking temperatures, um, frequent vital sign checks, um, really just uh, you know, communicating with the patient about how they're feeling um, and making sure that they're, they're reporting um, any changes in their status. So that's one umbrella. It's called cytokine release syndrome. Um, quick, quick another question about, about yeah. so kind of what you described, it sounds like cytokine releasism release syndrome is expected. Is, is it a good thing to experience cytokine release syndrome? Does it mean that the that's a very working? good question? I'm actually really glad that you asked that um, because a lot of patients come to me thinking um, in my last job, because I managed um, patients getting CAR T cell therapy, patients came to me thinking, um, okay, so like I've got to have the fevers, got to hunker down. I'm going to have these bad fevers. And if I don't have them, it means the therapy's not working. And that's not the case actually. Um, I know it's kind of harsh to say, but um, as healthcare providers, when we, when I was caring for patients um, receiving this therapy, when they did have these side effects, we would always say to them, I'm terribly sorry, you know, that you feel crummy, you know, that you're feeling this way, but it does mean that the cells have supercharged your immune system and that your, your body is attacking your cancer. So it's a good thing. However, just because we have that correlation does not mean that if you don't have the side effects, that the, that the therapy is not going to work for you. And, and in saying that, the amount and the degree of um, cytokine release syndrome that a patient has is dependent on a number of things. It's dependent on the, the type of CAR-T product. There are multiple CAR-T products on the market. Every product has a different incidence of CRS. 
it depends on the patient's disease um, and it depends on the patient's disease burden um, as to how much of that side effect they have. Really great question. Thank you for asking. And when you say disease burden, do you mean the number of cancer cells? Yeah. So the number of cancer cells. So, um, you know, people with leukemia, the higher the blast count, the more leukemia they have. Um, people with lymphoma, uh, the more tumor burden, the more tumors they have in their body, um, generally the higher incidence of um, CRS that they're going to have. Um, but in my, my personal experience, and I've seen hundreds of patients receive this therapy, I've had patients with really high disease burden that don't have any cytokine release syndrome. And, you know, they go... They they go into remission. Um, so it's, it's not, I hate, I hated, um, when patients would be like, Oh my gosh, it's not working. I haven't had fevers. I'm not feeling really terrible. This, it didn't work. Um, you know, we have to really reassure them like that's, it is not, um, causation, you know, just because you had this does not mean you're going to go into remission and vice versa. So awesome. thank you for thank asking. You, Chrissy. That Those are yeah. really helpful. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then again, so but going back, the second umbrella of side effects is something called neurological toxicity. There's a couple of different acronyms that people use for it. Um, the only currently, you know, approved acronym is something called ICANS. You might hear it referred to as CRESS um, or neurotox, um, neurological toxicity. Um, it presents in a number of different ways in patients. Um, something as simple as um, just forgetting what day it is, um, trouble finding words, tr um, tremors, um, being more sleepy than usual, feeling really drowsy um, and responding more slowly than one normally would. Um, and then as severe as seizures um, and being completely unconscious. Um, so because of the risk of neurological toxicity, there's a number of um, safety measures um, that authorized treatment facilities um, have to ensure are, are being taken. So one is that patients who receive this therapy cannot drive for eight weeks. Um, so this is really important that um, any, it's, imperative that any patient um, that gets this therapy has to have a caregiver because they can't drive. So, you know, going to and from the clinic for um, provider appointments, um, you know, leaving the hospital, heading back to your hotel, et cetera, uh, someone has to drive these patients. Um, and then most institutions um, that utilize this therapy, um, put patients on a prophylactic dose of seizure medications for a couple of weeks, um, up to a month, um, just to prevent seizures. Um, and then um, there are ways of managing uh, both these side effects, both CRS and neurological toxicity, um, one being um, steroids. Um, they can be utilized, and there's varying grades of both side effects, CRS and neurological toxicity. Um, the lower the grade, um, the less severe the side effect, and it goes up to grade four. And so all the treatment centers who utilize this therapy, have a, they utilize this grading system and, you know, um, if a patient's only having grade one, um, maybe maybe they're just having fevers, um, then they just manage the fevers like you would any other fevers. You would check for, you know, infection and give um, Tylenol to, to bring the fever down. But if it becomes fever and, you know, really low blood pressure, um, then you, you start to symptomatically treat a little bit more the higher the grade goes. And then you would um, start utilizing steroids when you get um, into grade two and beyond. Um, so the none of these side effects um, are permanent. Um, there have been rare cases where the neurological toxicity um, does persist um, for a long period of time and can be fatal, but it's extremely rare. Um, and um, I, yeah, so like not everyone um, gets the same type of CAR T cell therapy and everyone's going to respond differently. Um, I love to tell the story um, with regards to neurological toxicity. Um, I have had things as simple as patients having headaches for, you, you know, four to five days in a row. Um, I've had something, I had a patient once who was in the hospital and he was completely um, conversing normal and he was looking at the menu to order his dinner and he was pointing, knew he was pointing to mashed potatoes. That's what he wanted for his dinner, but he could not say the word. And he's like, I know that's what I want, but I can't, I can't find that word. Um, and then I've had patients who completely don't know who their loved ones are, um, don't know where they are, you know, um, don't know what year it is, et cetera. Um, and the side effect can advance pretty quickly. It can go from something as simple as not knowing where you are um, to, um, you know, be, not being able to um, speak um, quickly. So because of that, it's important that these patients are treated at those authorized treatment centers um, and that their caregivers um, are 
or well-educated in um, recognizing these symptoms and uh, reporting them to the healthcare professionals immediately. And because of, because of the risk of this, patients um, actually have to live um, or not live, but stay within two hours of the authorized treatment facilities. Two hours is the FDA guideline, um, but most centers that I know of in the U.S. require much closer than that. Uh, where I worked prior to LLS, our patients had to stay within 30 minutes, and that's pretty much normal across the board across the U.S. Um, what authorized treatment facilities want patients to um, stay within during their um, first four weeks of treatment. Then they can return, you know, to to where they're from and uh, back to their primary physicians. So Chrissy, uh, you mentioned some of the, the neurological issues that can happen like seizures and mm-hmm. trouble with word finding and things like that. How long might those last if someone experiences them and kind of what's the frequency of you know, what percent of patients would experience something like that? So that's a good question. And I have to tell you, it is product specific. Um, depending it, how many patients experience this um, toxicity is all dependent on what therapy the patient receives. Um, some, some products on the market right now have upwards of uh, 60% of neurological toxicity, but that's anywhere from headache Um, So a headache classifies, anxiety actually classifies as neurological toxicity. Um, And if you were to ask me, I don't, I can't recall, I can probably count on one hand how many patients I've had in my career working with cancer patients who don't have anxiety. Um, So um, yeah, so anything as small as headache and anxiety classifies under neurological toxicity. So there are some products that have toxicity percentages as high, you know, as 60%. Um, And then there are some that have it as low as um, 20 to 30%. Um, So it's all dependent on the product. um, And I don't have time to, you know, run through um, each and every product that's on the market. But um, the onset is generally um, in the first four to seven days. Um, Onset has happened as late as 48 days after CAR-T. And because of that, that's where they get the eight-week driving restriction. Um, They don't want, you know, a person who received this therapy to be behind the wheel of a car um, five weeks after they've received CAR-T and they suddenly get confused. Um, It's it's extremely rare to happen outside of the first seven days, really, Um, but it has occurred. And that's why the FDA has that mandate. So in terms of kind of putting CAR-T in some context with other treatments um, blood cancer patients may have experienced, um, would you say, so it sounds like there are safety issues. Would you kind of say that they're more or less or than, than like a chemotherapy, like a rituximab? Or, it's and, a good and question. Also- yeah. So um, I'll tell you, CRS is not unique to CAR-T. It's important to know that um, a lot of blood cancer patients have received something called um, rituxan. Rituxan can have CRS um, happen with infusion. So it's not something that um, is new um, and, you know, unique to CAR-T. Um, it's something that all healthcare professionals who work in the cancer world um, should know how to recognize and manage. Um, and I'm sure that they all do. Um, and, the CRS is generally only going to happen in the first 14 days. I personally have never seen someone have, and I have seen hundreds of patients. I have never seen someone have cytokine release syndrome outside of the first two weeks. Um, Now the neurological toxicity I have seen happen later, um, but it is, the duration is generally very short because um, corticosteroids do a very good job um, to treat the set, the neurological toxicity. Generally, once a patient has, has received um, anywhere from one to three doses of, of steroids, their neurological toxicity goes away pretty quickly. What okay. becomes um, an interesting kind of like balancing act for healthcare professionals is how to taper patients off of the steroids um, quickly so that they're not on steroids for too long uh, versus, um, you know, I've, I've had patients where when you taper them off, if you taper too quickly, the neurological toxicity comes back. So I've had, I can speak, you know, to one patient who had, we had to taper him off three different times. Um, and we just had to go slower and slower and slower each time he ended up being on steroids for a total of three weeks. It wasn't like this was, you know, something that was over months or anything. Um, but by the three week mark, we had him off of steroids and his neurological toxicity had completely resolved. Um, and so comparing, I wouldn't say like it's uh, more intense. It depends on who you talk to and it depends on their experience. I have patients who say, oh, this was way easier than my auto transplant. And I have patients who say, 
I would do an auto transplant 10 times over before doing that. It all depends on the patient's experience. Every patient, like I said, is going to receive a different pod- product and every patient is going to re- respond completely different. Um, I just think the patients should be rest assured knowing that this isn't a therapy that just anyone can give. Um, in order to be allowed by the FDA to give this therapy, healthcare institutions have to pass what's called a REMS um, requirement. So REMS stands for Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategy. All that is just a fancy term to say you can only give this therapy um, if you're trained in how to um, administer and safely monitor and care for these patients. So um, I was part of um, getting REMS certified in cell therapy back in 2017 when CAR-T was very first FDA approved. It was an undertaking at a hospital with over a thousand beds. We had over 500 people in one room that included our ER staff, our oncology staff, our transplant staff, our ICU staff, all pharmacy, all ED staff, all being trained on what CRS and neurological toxicity are, when the onset happens, how to properly manage, what not to do, what to do. Um, And every single person that is onboarded at every institution goes through this. Even if you're hired tomorrow, you still have to go through the same REMS training that the institution went through in 2017. And everyone has to go through it every single year. Um, And you're audited on it every single year. Um, by the pharmaceutical companies, as well as the FDA. So um, it's a very rigorous process, um, but it's done to ensure that patients are safely cared for. Um, because like, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious this is a, it can be a risky therapy um, if it's not done um, and managed properly. But sounds like the FDA the right is, around. yeah, the FDA yeah. has um, put in a lot of um, safety measures to ensure that this um, is only done at um, institutions that are well trained in uh, managing the ther- the patients. We should probably get to the fun part and ask how effective is this? What what can a patient expect uh, in terms of the the efficacy of yeah. the drug? So how how well it's going to work? Yeah, so um, in the leukemia um, sphere, which there's currently only one product on the market, um, it's about 80 80 to 85% effective in patients who are relapsed um, or refractory um, pediatric ALL. So that's currently the only leukemia product approved. Um, In the the lymphoma world, um, there's FDA-approved products for um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, including DLBCL, um, primary mediastinal, Um, large cell lymphoma, uh, follicular lymphoma, and um, mantle cell lymphoma. And there is um, also now recently approved um, just, um, I think earlier this year, multiple myeloma. Um, In the leukemia world, like I said, it's about 80 to 85%. In the lymphoma world, speaking specifically to uh, DLBCL and um, transform follicular lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. It's about 65% um, overall response rate with about a 45% um, complete remission rate ar- at around the three year mark. Um, and then in the myeloma world, it's, it's around um, 60 to 70% of patients respond um, with the um, longest response being around 11, month, 11 to 12 months. So in the myeloma world, we have a lot of improvement to do in my opinion, um, just because um, you know that's, that's not enough. That's not long enough for me. I want um, my, myeloma patients, really all patients um, you know, to be cured. And so, um, like I said, 11, 11 to 12 months is about the best response they're seeing with the current FDA approved um, myeloma CAR-T. So it- you know, I think when when CAR T was kind of first coming about, some people were talking about the C word. Mm-hmm. Um, is that so? Have you seen that happen? Is that something that so, um, the so patients? What should they think about that going in? So the C word, um, as you know, is um, something we don't in in the blood cancer world. We don't like to say it until five years cancer free, mm-hmm. um, and CAR T is very new. Um, I have been um, working with CAR-T in my personal, ex- you know, my, my career for since about 2015. So we're past that now, right? We're just, we're just getting past that five-year mark. And there are a number of patients who received CAR-T um, in the early stages, which was for back in the early days, it was only for leukemia and lymphoma. There are a number of patients um, who are still in remission from receiving that therapy back then. So 
Um, I think that it's um, a potential. I, it's, it's not a panacea. It's not a cure-all for, you know, everyone. There's, there is um, ways to improve it. And that's what's being studied, um, you know, because we want hundred percent, we don't want 60 to 80%, right? We want to improve it. So how do we improve it? And that's what clinical trials are currently studying. Um, do, we, do we make dual targets instead of one target on a patient's cancer cell? Do we target two different things? Um, do we do multiple doses of CAR-T? Um, do we use allogeneic CAR T, meaning do we do it from a healthy donor? Um, you know, theoretically, when a patient um, gets to um, CAR T right now, they've at least failed w- at least one line of therapy. Um, the majority of the regimen, the uh, products out there require a patient has failed two or more lines of therapy. So if a patient has had all of that therapy, um, their immune system has been beat down over months and months. Um, so maybe their T cells aren't as effective as if, you know, we were to use like my cells or someone who's never had cancer and never received chemotherapy. So they're um, uh, studying um CAR T cells that have been manufactured from healthy donors. There's also the the thought that, you know, while a patient uh, waits that two to four weeks for the cell manufacturing, their their cancer can get worse. And um, maybe they don't respond as well as they would have four weeks ago. Um, So if you have a a CAR T product from a healthy donor that, um, you know, John Smith goes to the cancer center on Monday and gets worked up for CAR T and he gets it later that week um, because it was off the shelf and it was already collected and manufactured from a donor. Um, So there's, you know, the uh, more readily available access to the therapy. If you use healthy donors, Um, there's, there's drugs being added, um, to a patients to help supercharge the CAR-T, um, you know, at intervals after the patient has received the CAR-T. Maybe a patient gets CAR-T on day zero, and then um, every week for the next four weeks, they get a drug that um, helps, you know, ramp up their immune system and, and boost those CAR-T um, um, at different intervals. So a lot of different things are being studied and how do we improve this? Um, it's also being studied and moving it up um, earlier in patients' diagnoses, because maybe if we give it to patients before they've received, um, you know, a lot of toxic chemotherapy, maybe their body will respond better. Maybe their immune system um, will be more responsive to the therapy. This is like the really cool thing about learning and exploring a new type of treatment option. We get to see what happens and how it's going to move forward. Right. Um, So y'all, we have reached the time. It is 8 p.m. I wanted to thank Christy and Jennifer for coming and LLS for sharing all this important information. And Dan, thank you for stepping up and asking all these great questions because your depth of knowledge is unmatched, especially in the good health world. So it has been really valuable to learn and hear so much. And I want to remind everybody, Lauren will be sending out an email in a week, a week and a half. We want to make sure we have this recording ready so we can send it all together. And thank you all for your time and for coming and being with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks so much, Jennifer and Chrissy. This is great. Yeah, bye. Appreciate it.